Consider this box in a three-dimensional space. If we rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise about the x-axis, we get this orientation. A second rotation about the y-axis brings the green side on top aligned with the z-axis. Now, let's start over with the same orientation, and this time, first rotate the box 90 degrees about the y-axis, following by another 90 degree rotation about the x-axis. You can see that the result is not the same. It shows that in this kind of rotation in three-dimensional space, the order of rotation is very important. In other words, these kinds of rotation operators do not commute. These are the three matrices associated with the three rotations about three coordinate axes. For each of them, the row and column associated with the axis of rotation have zero elements except the one that corresponds to the axis itself. For rotation about the x-axis, we are basically rotating the y-z-plane. For the rotation about the y-axis, x-z-plane is rotating. And when we rotate about the z-axis, the x-y-plane is affected. Pay attention that the rotation about each axis doesn't change the components related to that axis. If we have a point on the y-axis and rotate by alpha counterclockwise about the x-axis, the y and z components change to cosine alpha and sine alpha. In the same way, if we have a point on the z-axis and rotate by alpha in the same direction about the x-axis, the y component changes from 0 to minus sine alpha and the z component changes from 1 to cosine alpha. This is exactly the second column of our rotation matrix. And this one is exactly the z-axis. We have a similar situation for the rotation about the y-axis. This one corresponds to the z component and this one to the x component. And finally, for the rotation about the z-axis, we have these two columns for the rotation matrix about the z-axis. These expressions explicitly show the effect of the rotation matrix about the x-axis on each unit column vector. Pay attention that I have used the symbol T or transpose at the top corner to show that this should be a column vector, so we can multiply the square matrix we have. We can write the same expressions for rotations about y and z axes. One property of rotation matrices is that their determinant is always equal to 1. This means that a rotation preserves both the volume and the orientation of objects. Volumes don't get stretched or squashed, and a right-handed system remains right-handed, without any reflection. Another important property of rotation matrices is that their inverse is equal to their transpose, and in fact, this is also equal to the same rotation with the opposite angle. Geometrically, this makes sense because if you rotate an object forward by an angle alpha and then rotate it backwards by minus alpha, you end up exactly where you started. If you change the angle to the opposite, cosine remains the same, but the sine function changes sine and the inverse becomes the transpose. So, by multiplying these matrices with their transpose, we get the identity matrix. That shows the transpose is the inverse. Now you might ask, what if we want to rotate something about an arbitrary axis in the 3D space? For example, suppose that we want to rotate this vector about the arbitrary axis n, which is denoted by the unit vector n with these three components. What should we do? Geometrically speaking, by rotating about this axis, just the components on the 2D plane perpendicular to the axis rotate and change. So we can write the vector v as a sum of a parallel and a perpendicular component. The parallel component is the projection of vector v onto the axis and is characterized by the dot product. Also, the perpendicular component can be derived by a vector subtraction because v is the vector addition of the perpendicular and the parallel components. Pay attention that all these vectors lie in the same plane which is perpendicular to the blue plane. The rotation doesn't affect the parallel component, but changes the perpendicular one. These are the components of the perpendicular component after rotation. The blue component aligns with the perpendicular component of V, and the other component is perpendicular to this plane containing all the other vectors you see on the screen. We can find the direction of this green vector by calculating the cross product of N with V. The parallel component of V doesn't contribute to this because it is parallel to N and the cross product is zero. So by adding these three vectors, we can find an expression for the rotation about the N axis by angle theta. Now by using these two expressions, we can find the effect of rotation on the vector V 
based on solely angle theta and the unit vector n, but how can we find the matrix representation of the rotation? Let's represent the unit vector n by a column matrix and also vector v using another column matrix like this. If we can find a matrix representation of these two terms, we can find the matrix representation of the rotation matrix R. This term is the cross product of the two vectors and can be written in the form of a 3 by 1 column matrix. We are looking for a square matrix to multiply with the vector V so we can find the effect of R on that vector. By comparing, we find the first row to be this, this is the second row, and finally the last row of the square matrix is this. Now we have found a matrix that generates the cross product. This is the other term that contains a dot product of V and N, which gives a scalar, multiplied by the unit vector N. Again, we are interested in separating the influence of our matrix on the column vector V, so we write it as a square matrix acting on column vector V. You might not believe it, but this square matrix is the product of N with its transpose. Pay attention that N transpose is a 1 by 3 matrix and N is a 3 by 1 matrix. This product you see on the screen is called the inner product of the two vectors. On the other hand, this is called the outer product, which gives a matrix with the dimension of the first vector multiplied by the dimension of the second vector. Now we can write our rotation matrix in this form. There are three terms and I hope by now the three matrices you see make sense. Interestingly, if we multiply the square matrix in the middle by itself, we come up with this matrix. We know that the sum of squares of the components of the unit vector n is 1 because it is a unit vector. So the elements on the diagonal of this matrix can be written in this form. And we have found a relationship between the two square matrices we derived earlier. This is another form of writing the rotation matrix in terms of one of the square matrices. As an example, by using the three unit vectors along the three coordinate axes, we can write these three matrices. And we can easily find the squares. Now, take a look at these elements. They all have to be multiplied by sine theta, and I guess you can remember that on these elements, we had either sine of theta or minus sine of theta. Also for these three elements, and because of the first term, we will only see elements equal to 1 in the matrix. And finally, these elements being multiplied by 1 minus cosine theta and added by the identity matrix account for the cosines in these three matrices. And all the other elements are, of course, 0. All 3x3 three three real rotation matrices that describe rotations in three-dimensional space and for which the transpose is the inverse and the determinant is 1, form a group called Special Orthogonal Group or SO3, for which the elements are not commutative. So it is an example of a non-abelian group with a lot of interesting properties that are very useful in many fields, especially physics. There are lots of other things to say about SO3, but for now we are going to start talking about vector spaces, which is the subject of the next video.